Hi, everybody. Mrs. Gennardo here. Today we're doing Law for Kids, and we have an episode from You Be the Jury, the Courtroom Collection. Okay, this week's case is the case of the broken display case. This is a case about circumstantial evidence. That means there is a group of facts that can lead the jury to decide guilt or innocence. There must be enough evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt. Who's who? Well, we have Edward Carlson, the defendant. He is accused of breaking the glass display case in the Sheridan School. We have Stephen Stone, school principal, the witness, and the state, the accusers, also known as the plaintiff. Let's listen to the case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when a person on, is on trial for a crime and they cannot be positively identified, the court may rely on circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is a group of facts that can lead the jury to decide if the person is guilty or innocent. There must be enough evidence to prove a person guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. The state has accused Edward Carlson, the defendant, of breaking the glass display case in the Sheridan School gym with the intent to steal a valuable trophy. Mr. Carlson claims he is innocent of this crime. The state called Stephen Stone, the Sheridan School principal, to the witness stand. Every year during spring vacation, Sheridan School holds its annual fair. This year, the money was raised to buy new equipment for the soccer team. This fair is a major event. Everyone in the community looks forward to it. There are booths with games of chance and skill. Other booths have food and student crafts for sale. The fair is held in the school gym. This year, Edward Carlson, a cafeteria worker, volunteered to be in charge of the bowling booth. At six o'clock on the evening before the fair, I was about to leave the school for the night. As I passed the gym, I heard a strange noise inside. When I opened the door, I could see someone at the far end of the gym standing over the display case. He was holding a large object raised over his head. Before I could yell for him to stop, he smashed the top of the display case with the object. Exhibit A is a photograph of the broken display case. The sterling silver trophy inside was untouched. The principal had in interrupted the intruder before he was able to remove it. The principal continued his testimony. I chased the intruder and he ran into the boy's locker room. I was right behind him. From the locker room, he ran into the gym office and then out the rear door. He was running too fast for me to catch him. The principal was unable to see the face of the intruder, but described him as male, approximately six feet tall, wearing a white t-shirt, dark pants, and sneakers. When the principal returned to the gym office, he noticed a bowling pin lying on the floor. It looked like the object was used to break the display case. He turned it over to the police and they examined it for fingerprints. The pin with the print marks is exhibit B. Because the bowling pin was scratched from use, it is impossible to tell for sure if it was the object used to smash the display case. The police determined the prints on the bowling pin match those of Edward Carlson. Further investigation has shown that the defendant has a criminal record of petty larceny or small thefts. A record of his arrest and his fingerprints are shown in exhibit C. The testimony of Edward Carlson was then presented. First, the question and the answer. Where were you at six o'clock in the evening before the fair? I was finishing setting up the bowling booth and I left school around four o'clock. At six o'clock, I was in my apartment watching television. Was there anybody with you who can verify that you were in your apartment at the time in question? I live alone with my dog, Mutt. I don't remember anybody seeing me enter that night. Does that mean you have no one who can verify your whereabouts at six o'clock? No one saw me. What do you account for your fingerprints? How do you account for your fingerprints on the bowling pin? Well, sure they're my prints. I picked up a bunch of bowling pins from the supply closet in the gym office. They were for the fair booth. I made two trips to the office. One was for the bowling balls and the other for the pins. But why was the bowling pin in exhibit B found on the gym floor? My arms were full. I must have dropped one while I was carrying them to the gym. If you dropped a bowling pin, why didn't you pick it up? I never actually heard the pin fall, but one must have dropped. That's the only way I can explain it being on the office floor. There was banging and sawing going on in the gym. Other people were setting up their booths. There was too much noise to hear the bowling pin drop. 
Defense claims that since the principal never saw the intruder drop a bowling pin as he chased him, there was no way to prove the pin on the office floor was the object used to break the display case. The state claims that since the bowling pin found on the office floor bears the fingerprints of Edward Carlson, then it is logical to conclude that he was the intruder and that he dropped the pin as he was chased by the principal. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have just heard the case of the broken display case. You must decide the merits of the state's claim. Be sure to examine carefully the evidence, exhibits A, B, and C. Was Edward Carlson the person who smashed the display case or was the intruder someone else? Okay, so that's the case, everybody. You should press pause right now as you deliberate and then come back with your verdict. The verdict will be on the next slide. And the verdict is in, not guilty. The fingerprints in exhibit B show how Carson had grabbed the bowling pin. He held the wide part of the pin. If the bowling pin had been used to smash the display case, he would have grabbed it by the narrow neck, holding the pin upside down. The end.